Greetings, friends. I'm pleased to welcome you on this last Sunday of January 2021. We are glad to have you join us for our time of worship and reflection. I'm Pastor Del Keeney of the Mechanicsburg Church of the Brethren. And on behalf of our congregation, I am pleased that we can gather together in this way. In times when we cannot fellowship as we would prefer, we are blessed to have ways that we can connect with each other. This morning, we've already been led into worship by the music that has prepared us for this time. I invite you also to be led by the words of the psalmist as we reflect today on who God is and who God calls us to be in response. We'll be reading from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The psalmist has a great deal to testify about God's accomplishments and God's deeds. But he also reminds us of our calling to be in awe, in reverence, in fear of the Lord as the place where we stand to come to understand our place in the world and in his kingdom. I invite you now to join me in a time of prayer as we enter worship. Holy God, we do proclaim your majesty in this day. The wonder of your creation and your mighty deeds is worth our attention and our praise. But we know as we gather in this day that you have a special purpose, not only for your creation, but for those you have placed within it, for the people that you have called your own through your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. May you guide us in this time of worship and reflection to see more deeply our call to follow in his steps, not only in faithfulness, but in the way that we value one another as he has valued us. Guide us now in this worship. May your spirit enliven us. May your word guide us. And may your son be the focus of our attention and our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in our opening hymn, number 49 in our Church of the Brethren hymnal, From All That Dwell Below the Skies. Join us as we sing our praise to God. Skies, 
Let the Creator's praise arise. Let the Redeemer's name be sung through every land by every tongue. In every land be Cheerful sounds all voices raised And fill the world with loudest praise Your lofty themes all mortals bring In songs of praise divinely sing The great salvation And shout for joy the Savior's name. Eternal are your mercies, Lord. Eternal truth attends your word. Your praise shall sound from shore to shore. Till sun shall rise and set no more. This morning our gospel reading comes again from the gospel of Mark. We find ourselves here in the first chapter watching as Jesus begins his ministry on this particular day, entering the synagogue of Capernaum. Listen as I read. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. As we move toward this time of interlude, I invite you to consider another setting of this story from Mark, written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette in her hymn, Christ in Capernaum. It is set to the tune of praise to the Lord the Almighty. You may sing or listen as you are able, as you consider this testimony. Love that informed all their law 
truth that was kind and far-reaching. Into that place came a man who was troubled in spirit. He cried aloud so the worshipping people could hear it. All mixed with fear, God's loving reign had come near. Evil could simply not bear it. Lord, you rebuked all that kept him from knowing God's healing. You countered evil with power that sent spirits railing. God has control. God wants our lives to be was what you were revealing. Still there is evil that tries to destroy and enslave us. Still by your grace we encounter your power to save us. You heal our pain, showing the joy of God's reign. This is the teaching you give us. As we have heard from the gospel, we also invite you to listen to one of Paul's communiques, his letter with the church at Corinth a fledgling church gathered in of those who have worshipped other gods, but who now are serving the one God. Listen to the conversation. Even though it travels just one way, it reflects a back and forth that is happening with this community and the Apostle Paul as he teaches them. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin 
against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This too is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? O God, open your people now that we may attend to your word and that we may consider where it takes us in our day and time. Guide the one who speaks that your word might be spoken and those who listen that it might be received in ways that help to change us that we may be a testament to your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Friends, we're reminded in the reading from 1 Corinthians that though we might be surprised at this, we are not the first to believe that we know something and to believe it with conviction and to be concerned that others don't know what we know. In our culture today, we have been bombarded with perspectives of what is going on in the world, what is going on in our nation, what is going on in our lives. Each one of us, in some fashion, has settled into a place where we think we know what is going on, and we've decided to have that knowing guide us. Now, that's not a terrible thing for us to do. In fact, each one of us, each day, need to determine what will guide our lives and what information will be most helpful to us on the way. But at a time when we are bombarded with such disparate views, it's important to remember not only what do we know, but what are we to do with what we know. There were some in that new fledgling community of Corinth a Christian community just emerging into life, who were convinced that they knew what was going on, that they understood what Jesus had done for them through his death and resurrection, and that they were convinced that they understood what that meant in their local culture. They had a less than positive view towards some others around them who had a different understanding or who hadn't grasped what they already knew. Now, sometimes it's easy for us to find our connections within the scriptures. Sometimes it's a bit more difficult And today's passage from Corinthians raises an issue that to us is not a life-challenging issue. I don't know many of us that stay awake at night wondering if we've eaten meat offered to idols or not. We may have other concerns about dietary uh, choices, whether they are healthy for us, whether they are good for us, whether they help the environment or hinder it. But meat offered to idols is not our concern. And yet, in this scripture, we find a powerful testimony that can speak to us 
about the things that matter to us in our faith lives. One of the things that's a bit challenging for us to grasp, but was a reality within that community in Corinth, is that all the meat, everything that was killed and prepared for eating, had been offered to some god. Corinth is a cosmopolitan place, a crossroads of commerce, and as such, there are many gods that are worshipped there. And in fact, remember that these Christians, most of them that we know of in Corinth, have been a part of those other cults, those other religious groups. They have worshipped other gods, as did everybody in the culture. But now they have been invited into a relationship with the living God and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean about their former life and how they are now to live? Well, they have two very different perspectives on that. There are those to whom Paul is speaking that see themselves in the know, that they have gained this knowledge that will allow them to see what really matters and to act on it. And they see that there is no concern about meat offered to idols because those idols don't exist. Those gods don't really exist. And so they find freedom in doing, in acting, in uh, living out their lives in their community as they did before. It doesn't matter where they eat. Now do understand that wherever they eat, they are eating, unless they're in their own homes, eating food offered to idols. In fact, in many of their own homes, if they bought something at the local butcher shop, it would have been sacrificed to an idol before they received it. But they sense freedom. Freedom has come their way in Christ. They don't have to worry about those restrictions. But apparently, and these folks do not have the voice right now in this interaction between Paul and the church, apparently there are some who are struggling more. Some who have been a part of those other rituals, who have practiced them, believing that there were gods that uh, took care of them if they sacrificed in certain ways, if they participated in the rituals. And now they too have become committed to Christ. But they've understood their truth tells them that they should not touch, that they should not participate in any way in those rituals, that they should avoid the meat that is offered to idols. And anyone who doesn't is being unfaithful. Well, you see where that begins to play out. Each has a level of knowledge, a frame of reference that tells them that what they are doing is true and what others are doing is not. It doesn't take much there to bring it to our lives and our days. As I talked with our Bible study group this week, I referenced how in my growing up, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was a strong presence within our faith community. And the challenge to abstinence was a clear challenge given to us as children all the way on up. That was a perspective. And indeed, Sobriety and abstinence was equated with faithful Christianity. It was a bit of a jar for me. Going away to college, 
finding my way in the world and discovering other Christians for whom abstinence was not a requirement for Christianity. It was a hard sell. It was challenging to get around. Now, there were other situations like that that uh, tested me as I went away. Where I grew up, there was a certain way of communing, a certain way of doing love feast, for example, a way that, uh, that seemed to be the right way. And I only imagined that everyone did it as we did. Until I went away and joined a fellowship in another community. And my truth was tested because what I thought was the way was not the only way to honor Christ and to serve each other. Well, you know, as I do, that there are points both within the church and within our culture in which persons differ in their understanding of what is true and what is right. In no way do I sit here to suggest that everything is relative. It is not. But, but the Apostle Paul has something to say to us as he does to his fledgling community in Corinth when he reminds us that knowledge has this tendency to fill us up, to make us so full of our stuff and ourselves that we have little room for another and what matters to them. Paul reminds us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And love is not just a generic kind of goodness that says, oh, it doesn't matter what you are doing. Love, rather, is an action that gives attention and value to the journey of the one who may be different than you as you respond to them, as you care for them. It's fascinating to me that in the gospel reading for this morning from the first chapter of Mark, that Jesus in his initial actions, in this teaching moment and this healing moment, models that sort of thing for us. Of course, Mark points out that Jesus is speaking with authority. But I find it fascinating that in responding to the one who is in the midst of all of these people in worship, this one who is described as having the unclean spirit. And again, that's one of those places where we struggle a bit to make the connection with that culture and that understanding. We frame those understandings often in a different way. But please know that Jesus sees the difference between that in this man that is unclean or resistant and the man himself. He does not devalue this one who is making noise in church and calling out and in fact naming who Jesus is. He does not give that resistant spirit authority. In fact, he silences it. But he calls it to come out of the man, recognizing that what this one needs is not to be shunned, is not to be disregarded, but is to be healed. And there is a path of healing and growth for him. Now, we are not in the position of doing the kinds of things that Jesus does. As he speaks with authority, 
as he calls out the unclean spirits, as he brings healing by his touch. But we are called to reflect his love as we deal with each other when we feel we have a handle on the truth and we just need to convince someone else what that is. There may indeed be a place for us to share the reason for the hope we have. But that place comes as we earn the right to share by listening. Listening to the hearts of those like those in Corinth who truly are distressed by their experience of leaving a commitment to other gods and separating themselves from that. Those with great freedom don't see the point. But Paul reminds them that whether or not they value the concern, they need to value their brother or their sister. Today, friends, we have a great deal more knowledge than the Corinthian church would have had about so many things. We know about things that they could not have even imagined. And yet, what Paul said to them is the message we need to hear about all of our knowledge. And that is knowledge by itself as persons of faith, as followers of Jesus is not enough. Because knowledge has this tendency to fill us up. And if we believe that we have the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth then we miss being what we need to be for our brother or sister in Christ. Remember, friends, knowledge puffs up. It's love, valuing each other that builds up as we listen even in the midst of deep differences and as we find ways for each of us to grow in Christ. I pray that in all that we know, and in the chaos of all the different viewpoints that we hear, we may hold on to that conviction. The truth is a part of God's message for us. The truth conveyed with love, is the gospel. Will you join me in prayer? Holy One, forgive us when we find ourselves so full of what we believe is right that we cannot see you at work in another. You know how these days test us. Deep, deep convictions, often that differ, that seem to have no common ground. And yet, and yet there is the common ground of our call to love each other a love that isn't always expressed in how we feel, but how we act, what we demonstrate. As we seek your forgiveness, we also seek wisdom beyond our knowledge. The wisdom that comes as we sense both your truth and your love at work in our lives. May we receive both so that we can share both, not only in our communities of faith, but with our neighbors, with our nation, 
with our world. May we thus become a testimony to your kingdom and your good news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I invite you to respond to the word by joining with us in singing this hymn from our Church of the Brethren hymnal. Number 420, Heart with Loving Heart United. Let us sing and let this be our testimony of our commitment to Christ and to each other. Friends, as we go from this time of worship and reflection, may the words that we have shared provide a challenge for you in your daily walk. May you think about the truth that you have been called to trust. And may you think about the love that you have been called to share. For in Christ, truth and love are intertwined. And as his followers, we can do no less than carry them both into the world. May you go this day then, serving Christ and each other with faith, hope, and love. Amen.